Aloha and Happy New Year. I'm your host, Krista Stadler, and welcome to the Condor Insider Show, where we discuss all things relative to condo living and your condo investment. Today, we'll be discussing costly discrimination and safety issues and how to avoid them. Our guest today is attorney Porter DeVries with DeVries and Associates. Hi, Porter. Welcome back. Hi, Krista. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Thank you. I just wanted to take a minute um, to have you just tell us a little bit about your um, law firm and um, anything sure. you'd like to tell us about yourself. Great. So, uh, yeah, my law firm, Debris & Associates, uh, we've got offices here at Honolulu as well as in Kailua, Kona, um, and we represent clients across the state. Uh, primarily, our focus is everything real estate. So if it touches on real estate, if Real estate is the hub of uh, the issue. Uh, we're going to work on that. Uh, so we end up representing a lot of condo associations. We provide general counsel services to the board. Uh, we also represent individual homeowners in transactions, uh, as well as some developers um, for various projects. Um, so that's a bit about us. Um, and how long have you been in Hawaii, you personally? Oh, so I, yeah, this is our seventh year. I've been here for a little six and a half years I've been here. Um, so yeah, we're entering our seventh year. Awesome. Well, you sound like the perfect person to discuss some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. And um, the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about was discrimination and maybe um, discriminatory actions that can take place that people don't realize are discriminatory and understanding the the state laws regarding discrimination versus the federal laws. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, discrimination is definitely something that can be uh, misunderstood or under understood, um, but it all starts with the protected classes. Um, a protected class at the federal level consists of race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. Hawaii adds to that at the state level, adds protected classes of gender identity and expression, HIV status, age, marital status, and sexual orientation. And so uh, between all of these, the analysis of any kind of discrimination claim starts with, is the, the subject a member of one of these classes? And so Obviously, race has been uh, a big issue in our country's history. Um, here in Hawaii, we're a very diverse area. You know, we, I, I think, are pretty sensitive to that and, and understand that one. Uh, it's pretty clear cut, uh, discriminating on the basis of race. When we get into things like familial status, it can be a little bit uh, less obvious. So, um, discriminating against someone who has children, uh, singling them out for actions of children. Uh, in say a common area, uh, that would be an example of something where, um, you know, the policy of the board, a, a house rule that limits a common area to adults only, uh, unless there's a really compelling reason to have only adults there, uh, to find somebody or to issue a warning to someone for having children in that area, uh, that would be a form of discrimination. Thank you. Is there anything, I know the hot topic these days is uh, marijuana, you know, medical, medicinal marijuana, and also um, comfort animals, which is a whole other subject, but how, so you have a situation, let's say, where somebody is using medicinal marijuana. Now, how would you relate that back to one of those categories that we were just, that you were just sharing with us? Right. So a medicinal marijuana user is somebody who has a car, they've got um, a legal right to use marijuana for medical purposes. Um, and they have that right on the basis of a disability. And because of that, they then fall into a protected class. Um, so there is a potential for discrimination, you know, someone who is using medical marijuana. Uh, the condo statute, 514B, um, as well as the HOA statute, uh, 421J, uh, both have specific language um, protecting medical marijuana users uh, and you know, basically eliminating uh, or trying to eliminate with, with that statutory provision um, any kind of repercussions for those users. So 
let's say, and I'll say it for myself. I get out of my elevator at my condo, and if someone's cooking bacon, I can smell it. If someone's making some kind of great type of ethnic food, I can smell it. But I also can walk off the elevator and get hit in the face with the smell of marijuana, um, which to me, I don't particularly care for that. And it kind of feels like it permeates the carpet and everything. What what kind of, um, if, if I wanted to go complain as an owner or a tenant about that happening, can I do that? Or, or do they just basically have carte blanche to to smoke and and have the hallways filled with the with the smoke. Yeah, that's a great example um, of a fairly common situation. Uh, you know, I've heard of this in, in several instances. The the medical marijuana user doesn't have carte blanche. That's that's uh, a given, but they do have a right to use medical marijuana. Um, you as a neighbor, you have a right, whether you're a tenant or an owner, and whether this uh, user is a tenant or an owner, but you have a right to file a complaint about that, raise this uh, issue with your on-site property manager, or to bring it up at a board meeting, um, seeking so some kind of enforcement. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. The potential for discrimination comes with, or at the stage of where the board would step in or the property manager, if they're authorized, would step in to issue a fine or a warning notice, uh, something like that. The an initial reaction, and I've seen this a couple of times, where the initial reaction is, well, we need to cite them for smoking marijuana in their unit and you know that's getting out into the hallways, for example, as you described. The, that's potentially a discriminatory action against them uh, because again, they have that statutory right and uh, being having this disability, uh, they've got federal protections as well. Um, so when it comes to actually enforcing this or doing something, taking some kind of uh, step to reduce this, the impact of this, uh, the action needs to be focused on the effects of it. So what somebody does in their unit to, you know, for medical purposes, you know, that's really not something that the board could regulate. When it's getting out into the hallway, now that's something that the board could regulate. Mm -hmm. So an action that the board would take would be to limit this nuisance, which is the smoke getting into the hallway and, you know, possibly getting into other units or whatever. Um, so the, again, they, like the enforcement action needs to be against something that isn't related to the basis for this per person being in a, a protected class. It's very interesting because, and I appreciate your expertise on this because I was always under the understanding that if the house rules or the lease agreement, if it was a rental, stated no smoking of any kind, meaning you know anything, um, that that would include medicinal marijuana being smoked. That they would have to t cook it, cook it in a brownies, butter, whatever form they want, a capsule, however they want to take it. But you shared with me earlier that no, they can choose to use whatever method they want to, which would, could include smoking. So that that was a real bit of information that I didn't have. Should, yeah. Should have called my attorney right. about I, I, that. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it does seem to be, um, you know, kind of counterintuitive. Uh, you know, if you've got an absolute restriction against smoking uh, to allow that, then uh, it seems right, just counterintuitive, but that's where the statute comes in to provide uh, those explicit protections for medical marijuana users. It seems like there's other there are other things out there that if you just looked at the you know written word on a house rule as it stands, you know you I, th I think what happens is there's a feeling of well it's in writing and it's right there you know and you signed that you were going to abide by the house rules not not necessarily related to the medicinal marijuana but could be. But also things like this particular settlement that I was reading about where um, some folks were, you know, honoring their religious tradition and having a, a Jewish some type of de decoration put on the outside of their door. And the house rules stated there was not to be anything put on the doors. And the board went ahead, I would imagine, without consulting um, you know, an attorney. I would, I would think that they hadn't consulted an attorney and actually removed it. And they ended up settling for forty thousand dollars. Forty thousand dollars by making that mistake. Right. 
So I, and that was probably, uh, you know, separate from the attorney's fees that they paid. I <laughs> would imagine, yeah. So it just seems like there needs to be kind of a little bit of a, a light bulb that goes off when any type of a concern or any type of action is going to be taken to maybe consider it a little bit more, maybe take the time to run it by an attorney before you write that email or send out that fine. I mean, I'm not talking every little obvious case, but when it's a little off and you're not quite sure, uh, it seems like they could avoid um, a lot of time, effort, and money by just taking that step to begin with. Yeah, and, and I think you're right that there's often this kind of um, allegiance to the written documents uh, that can be blinding, you know, and, and so somebody's looking at this saying, well, you can't put anything on the outside of your door. Well, that applies to everybody. And if we're to create an exception for one person, then we're open up to potential for claims for um, selective enforcement of CCNRs or house rules. Um, so th that's where a legal opinion comes in, you know, and, you know, these issues, you know, really should get some kind of legal review at a minimum, just to ensure that kind of the bigger picture, the objective picture is being considered mm -hmm. uh, and boards don't find themselves going down this path of just strict enforcement and adherence to the rules when, well, maybe those rules aren't necessarily entirely enforceable or in this particular situation, they uh, wouldn't be enforced in the same way that the board is trying to. Conflict with other laws that have to be considered. I've even seen um, situations where an association's had their house rules written maybe 20 years ago. So verbiage in the house rules or you know, re uh, specifically related to comfort or assistance animals where it just says, point blank, no, no animals, and then they just stick with that and don't have the understanding that times have changed and there's other things to consider related to um, being able to accommodate those type of requests and, and whatnot. But there again, those particular folks that have those, a comfort or an assistant animal, have to make sure that they're not, that they're still not causing uh, disturbances or, you know, feces out in the yard, you know, normal things like that, that again, isn't about the animal necessarily, it's about the result of what's happening. Is that correct? Well, yeah, certainly the, the result of, uh, you know, in this case, having a comfort pet, uh, you know, that if, if they are, uh, if they do pull this person, the owner into um, a protected class uh, with a disability, uh, that house rule that was written 20 years ago, it's just out of date. It doesn't match with the current laws and really can't be strictly enforced like that. Um, but I think that kind of raises a, an interesting point or, or a good point for everybody, you know, whether regardless of what side of these issues you're on, meaning, you know, if you're a board member, if you're a property manager, if you're an owner, uh, the, I think the point there is that over communication or over explanation may be necessary from one party or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So in that example where you've got 20 year old house rules and an owner comes in and says, well, I've got this emotional support animal. I've got, you know, it's documented. I have a legal right to have it here. Uh, the house rules are against that. It really should be incumbent upon the owner to over explain, share more information, um, provide more of an analysis to help the board understand I'm, rather I'm, than just I'm going to have to cut you off really fast. We're going to have yeah, to, to go you. to a break. <laughs> we're halfway through already. I can't even believe it. And we can, when we come back, we're going to talk about um, safety issues that aren't addressed and how that can cause uh, problems and legal issues and money. So we will see you in just a few minutes. Thank you. Just a few seconds. Thank you so much. And we'll see you back on Condo Insider. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at four o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen. 
close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at four o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Aloha and welcome back to Condo Insider. And we are here today with attorney Porter DeVries and we're going to continue talking about discrimination and the safety issues and how that can be very costly to an association, an owner, um, or even a property management company for that matter. So before we jump into the safety issues, Porter, I just wanted to share, I just want to really have the impact of how financially some of these mistakes uh, can be, the, the, the high amounts of money. And I just wanted to share, you know, I was doing some research, um, there was an owner that was sued and 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 in a federal court the the, the folks suing them 200 over 200,000 219,747 dollar judgment because um, unfortunately the tenant had a flesh eating bacteria disease and she didn't make it but her family went back and sued the landlord because they were evicting her attempting to evict her because of that. And apparently of the tens of thousands of cases that are brought uh, you know, to HUD or to jurisdiction related to discrimination, 50, supposedly, what I'm reading, 50% of them are related to disability issues. I thought that was very interesting. I, I guess because I'm on the rental management side, I would have thought it would have been um, you know, related to you know, if you have children or not and that type of thing. But that was very interesting to me. No? Yeah, it's, it's definitely that sort of issue, I think, is one that's definitely um, important or really comes on everybody's radar easily where, you know, you've got somebody who's potentially creating a hazard. Um, I mean, flesh-eating bacteria, that's um, pretty significant. I haven't <laughs> yeah. come across that one before. But, you know, there are examples, uh, the only one now with... Uh, an owner who is a hoarder, and as a result of their activities, um, they're attracting all kinds of uh, pests and you know, creating issues for their surrounding units. Um, this is something then that all of the the owners who are affected bring to the board's attention, and the board says, "Well, let's find a way to get them out of there." And well, you can't necessarily do that in all cases, and that's where legal opinion at the very beginning is important. Um, otherwise, they're potentially getting into something there where they could end up paying significantly in damages. Uh, so if you have a situation, or it sounds like you're dealing with a situation like that, can you address the effects, like as you would with the marijuana smoke in the hallway, can you address the effects of the hoarding rather than the hoarding itself? Like you know, infestation and, and those type of things? Is that how you move forward? Yeah, I mean, you have to, exactly. It's, it's, you can't address the thing that is, makes this person part of their protected class, you know, so their disability, um, you know, in this case, it's a diagnosed psychiatric disorder, um, which qualifies as a disability, meaning that, you know, we can't take actions against this person, um, related to that or these specific activities of hoarding and inactivity um, as with regard to throwing things out. Um, but yeah, when it comes to pests, uh, that's something where a fine can be imposed. Uh, the board can exercise its right to go in and fumigate if necessary. Um, all of this, of course, in accordance with the governing documents. Interesting. All right, well, I think it's time for us to move on to talking about some safety issues and lawsuits that are brought up uh, related to safety issues not being dealt with. Um, do you have any specifics that you'd like to share with us? 
Well, I, sure. Um, and I came across one pretty interesting issue recently was that was the installation of security cameras and whether that created um, or, or created an actual duty for the board to be monitoring what's going on. Um, so generally the board of directors has, uh, you know, they owe various duties to the owners and the association as a whole. And those are to act in the association's best interest, uh, to not be self-interested in their and self-dealing in their actions. Um, and fiduciary duties like that are, you know, pretty well understood under the, the heading of just do what's best for the association. Uh, when the board does things that are beyond what their basic duties are, they're potentially creating a situation where they could be held to a higher standard. And so this issue came up in a, in a court case where the installation of security cameras wasn't something that the board was required to do. Uh, you know, one of the arguments was that this was reasonable and necessary and there were other purposes. Um, but with that, the question, and it's still unanswered, is does installing those security cameras then uh, impliedly mean, or does that represent to the average owner that somebody's watching these, somebody's paying attention, somebody's acting on the things that are discovered on that tape? Wow. Boy, here in, in Honolulu, where we live, there's security cameras everywhere, but... <laughs> 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 right, security cameras. I mean, yeah, we're starting to see them everywhere, and you know, I think they are certainly helpful. Um, I love having them when we're trying to deal with something after the fact, which is pretty much the only time that attorneys are dealing with things. Yeah, um, we're looking back, and so to have some record that's clear and basically unimpeachable, uh, that's pretty awesome in yeah. those cases. Yeah. yeah. Well. I know there have been some recent, um, I don't think that it's actually gone to court yet, but there's been situations, I know there was a little girl that was 13 in Maui that fell out of a window um, last year. Um, you know, I've, ha I've actually had to terminate my relationship with clients because I've found, I can give a couple examples. Um, I had one situation where a l very large sliding glass door, the left side was, was coming out and extremely concerning, um, and they were not willing to fix it, and the people had a three-year-old child, uh, the tenants. So, uh, you know, that presents a huge liability to the company that I work for, to myself as a, real, a licensed real estate agent, and they refused to um, move forward with repairing it properly, securely. So I had to terminate my relationship with them, and I've also had situations where um, in wood decks or wood stairs that are faulty and weak, decaying, and they're not willing to make those repairs. So there's times when as the service provider or the agent, you, know, you have to make a decision whether if your client isn't willing to handle the safety issues that are ultimately gonna affect the tenant that you're placing in them um, and put yourself at risk, you have to make a decision whether or not you wanna keep that relationship going or not. So it's been, it's been Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, if I were representing you, I'd say absolutely drop these people. Uh, they're creating a liability for you uh, and just generally an unsafe situation all around. So, you know, the, the landlord, property owner, owner uh, property manager underneath them acting as an agent, uh, there are certain duties that are owed to the tenants. Uh, so whether it be you know, common law duties like habitability, possession, things like that, or uh, statutory protections, you know, like maintaining uh, utilities, if that's part of the agreement. You know, there are these duties that the property owner has to their tenants, and it's when they breach one of those duties and somebody gets hurt, and that legally the cause of that injury is, uh, is this breach of the duty. That's when we've got a lawsuit that's uh, ripe for a settlement, an easy settlement. Uh, yeah. So it all comes down to these duties. And, and so whether you're the board of directors, understanding your duties to the association or a homeowner that's renting a property, uh, what is the duty that you owe to people? And are you living up to that? I also think that 
the, the on-site managers of these large complexes maybe need to have more training, especially related to discrimination and fair housing. So I would like to see, in my dream world, I would like to see all of the general managers, resident managers, on-site managers be required or supported, encouraged by the boards and the association management to attend um, the annual fair housing workshops that are presented by HUD. There's so much great information and it can, things that they may be doing that, that, that they don't even realize shouldn't be done um, can be avoided, you know? So uh, it's just something I, anybody out there listening, please send your <laughs> on-site managers to the fair housing seminars. Yeah, so that, that's one big one. And the other thing that I did want to mention also, and I've seen some of these come across is RICO cases um, on the HOA side, or RICO complaints, um, boards not hiring licensed insured contractors for projects there you over $1,500. Yeah. Yeah, that so that's a good breach of duty a, right there. That's a huge yeah. one. And also having a very you know, well-written contract put together preferably by, preferably by their attorney. I mean, do you do that for associations? Do you write contracts we that do. they're going to put in place with their vendors? We do, and, and standard AIA construction contracts are pretty much the norm, uh, but they do leave a lot of room for uh, additions and interpretation, and, and there certainly are gray areas that should be reviewed by legal counsel. Uh, to ensure that the contract is complete, unambiguous, and, you know, protects everybody's interests. Um, but backing up just a second to hiring an unlicensed contractor, um, an association that does that or property manager who does that, uh, that is pretty much a clear breach of duty. Yes. Porter. Thank you so much for joining us again. <laughs> I can't believe we're yeah. running out of time. I'm always concerned are we going to have enough to talk about, but... Inevitably, unfortunately, in some cases, we do. And so I wish you a very happy new year. And I wish everyone out there in uh, Think Tech Hawaii world and, and who watches Condo Insider a very happy new year. And we will be back next week um, with a different host with a wonderful topic, which will be announced soon. So we hope to see you all then. And I appreciate you watching and hope you learned something. Thank you so much. Mahalo.